and maybe just introduce yourself and your origin story for Reedsy. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks for uh, for inviting me and for having me here. Um, so Ritzy was born really um, two years ago, and uh, out of the the idea that there was a lot of of great talent out there, editorial talent, design talent, marketing talent that was uh, kind of leaving traditional publishing companies to work uh, freelance, a little bit like authors started leaving their publishing companies to try self-publishing or hybrid publishing. And so we thought there are two very interesting trends that we could combine and kind of create this marketplace where we do, would allow um, authors to find the best editors, designers, and marketers uh, out there and kind of curate them and separate them from the um, well, from the wannabes, from the scammers, and from all these people that you can find on other marketplaces or by Googling uh, editing services. So that was really the, the vision for, for Reedsy, and that's what we've uh, built. Great. And I guess uh, you're doing this with a team of people, right? There's a few of you that thought this was a great idea, right? Yeah, no, we're a team of uh, we're in a team of seven now, uh, with a lot of uh, technical resources to kind of build the platform and make it as user friendly as possible, and also creating team to kind of go through all the profiles of our um, of freelancers. So we we receive over a hundred submissions uh, every week from freelancers, so that's editors, designers, publicists, and we currently accept between one percent and three percent of them. Um, and so all the people you find on Reedsy have traditional publishing experience. Uh, they've got obviously a full profile and a lot of them have worked with high profile um, authors and they're surprisingly affordable actually. Great. Yeah. So let's talk about what is probably your number one uh, service that people are most interested in. Sorry, you broke up a little bit. I couldn't... Uh, what's the number one uh, service that people that come to Reedsy are most interested in? Uh, I think it's editing, uh, but it might also be because we started with editing. Um, but we definitely have 70% of, uh, of authors on Reedsy looking for, for editing services, whether that's an editorial assessment, uh, deep developmental edit, a copy edit, or proofread. Um, that's what authors seem to be most interested in. And I think maybe that's also because the message around the um, around cover design hasn't um, gone through so much as the as the editing one has. Uh, a lot of authors know they need an editor and see the value in an editor, but they fail sometimes to see the value of a good cover designer. And that's also why we try to do these kind of webinars where we invite a cover designer um, with us. Mm -hmm. So let's just talk to a little bit more about editing. So there's developmental editing, there's line editing. So which kind of, it's, is it developmental or what stage are people or all stages are they coming to? I think most people are coming uh, at the at the developmental editing stage or editorial assessment. So that can be either at the end of the first draft, if you really don't like going alone through 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 the drafts, or it can usually be around third, fourth draft. Once once you've taken the manuscript to a point where you feel you cannot um, make it any better on your own, mm -hmm. and so you seek the advice of uh, of a professional who specializes in your genre, and who can. Um, basically give you advice on, on the structure of your manuscript, on the plot, on the characters, on the conflicts. Mm -hmm. And um, usually in editorial assessment, we say it's the best way to start um, because you get an edit letter uh, with which you can then go through your manuscript again and uh, make the changes that the, that the editor pointed out. But if you want to dive into a developmental edit, it's going to be a bit more expensive, but you're going to get the track changes, the comments and the track changes. Uh, annotations directly in the manuscript, so it's a bit more um, meat, editorial meat to to go with when when redrafting. And let's talk about too. I really like the Reedsy service and the guarantee and the vetting that you guys do. And because there's so many other services right now, you know, it's a free market out there in the world, right? There's so many different boards you can find people, and you could go on. I think it's Guru and Elance. I think it's called Odesk now, and you can find somebody who will edit a to our 300 page manuscript for, I don't know, $30 or $50 and it seems a little crazy. So uh, you're obviously probably getting a lower quality but some will charge seven or $800. So how do you guys differentiate yourselves from them? Um, you know, out there, just any other service? Yeah, I mean, you gotta think really um, about what it costs that person to, to read through your manuscript and make comments. And uh, so if someone charges $30, it's because they enjoy reading manuscripts 
and um, they want to read a manuscript almost for free and provide almost free comments. I mean, thirty dollars is nothing. Uh, if it takes you three, four hours to read the manuscript, then you're charging less than ten dollars an hour, so you're working for free. Uh, if you're an actual professional who makes a living out of editing, uh, then your rates per hour are obviously higher. So a developmental editing. I'm going to share some kind of data that we've uh, collected through Readsee. Mm -hmm. A developmental editing on a, um, let's say, 80,000 uh, word manuscript usually costs around $1,500. So you'll see quotes for $3,000 if uh, the editor is really, really, really experienced. Uh, and you'll see quotes for maybe 1000 really under 1000 and for an editorial assessment, it's going to range between um, five hundred dollars and a thousand five hundred. So, as you say, it's a free market. Um, there's a lot of price disparities, and even on a curated marketplace as like Reedsy, there's a lot of price disparities because it's a relatively new market, and editors don't always know what to charge. Uh, usually, it's when they used to work with publishing companies they got paid what the publishing companies paid them. They didn't have to kind of fix rates. Now that they're freelancers, they, can, they have to fix the rates and then don't always know how to do that. So we as a company have an additional role there as well. And so would you ever um, just forbid someone for charging, I don't know, $10,000 for manuscript editing? Do you have barriers or limits? Yeah, we check pricing on the marketplace. And if we see any weird things, then we're going to contact the, the professionals. Um, what we've seen is a couple of professionals charging uh, low prices because they had no idea what to charge. So we told mm -hmm. them, look, um, just like a friendly note, you can, you can raise your prices because you're, you're, under the, um, you're way under the average. And when we've seen people who charge awful amounts of money, then we kind of Progressively, um, I think they, they ran away on their own when they saw that authors didn't really accept their quotes. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we're at the stage where you can expect some price disparities, but not too many in the marketplace. Okay, great. And you know, I think it's a great opportunity that you are providing a marketplace for really good editors uh, and giving them that, that sort of certification or credential that, you know, you know, we vetted you. So can you talk a little bit about that vetting process and how you ensure that you have good editors on the desk? Yeah, for sure. So I mentioned earlier, we go through hundreds of profiles every week. And so when I mention a profile, so you can um, just sign up on Readsy and go through the marketplace. And when you click on a name, uh, you'll see kind of, um, kind of a LinkedIn profile, a bit more beautiful, um, where the editor basically mentions what they've worked on in their overview, um, so a short overview of who they are, then the genres they specialize in and the kind of editing also they provide, uh, then their work experience, so usually you'll see big name publishers in there, and then a portfolio with all the books that they've worked on that they can disclose, of course. Okay. And so we, we go through the portfolio, we check all the books, uh, we check that they're mentioned in the acknowledgments, uh, at least on some of these books. And if not, then we can reach out to the author and kind of make sure that they've worked with that editor. Uh, and uh, usually on LinkedIn or other websites, we're able to confirm that they've worked at the companies where they say they've worked. And so we double check the profiles. And based on the information of the profile, we accept or choose not to accept that person. Got it. And then I guess as time goes on, you know, some editors are a good or bad match for authors, or sometimes people just have an off day or a bad experience. When you get those kind of kind of complaints, uh, you know, how do you handle them? Or just oh, is it three strikes and you're out? Or what do you do? Um, so we've, we haven't had the, to do that yet. But yeah, the idea is kind of a few strikes and, and you're out. Um, mm -hmm. It's... It's always hard because you got to be fair both to the author and to the publishing professional. Uh, a lot of um, Reedsy users are first-time authors, and so they don't necessarily know how to expect. So there's an educational role for the editor, and that's where a lot of them struggle, uh, I must admit. So um, we're not going to get rid of an editor just because an author kind of complained that there wasn't enough communication. Mm -hmm. We're going to mention to that editor that they need to communicate more, especially if the author is a first-time author. Uh, but we haven't had any kind of real complaints. So what we do have is a satisfaction guarantee. So mm -hmm. if you're really not happy with the work that the editor or designer or publicist provided, then you can reach out to us and uh, in most cases we'll issue a refund. 
because wow. simply because we don't want to have a bad reputation uh, and because we want to ensure every author that they're safe on our marketplace, basically, whoever they work with because of the curation that we do. And as I said, we haven't had to do it yet, but I mean, I'm happy to do it for the first time. The first time. Right. No, I think that's great. I think there's a lot of value in offering that refund. And a lot of people do that, right? They'll say, we'll give you entire, all of your money back. And some people are like, we'll give you four times your money back if you're not happy because they're so confident and um, really want to show people they support their product and what they're giving. So I think I'm sure that contributes a lot because nobody else is giving that guarantee right now. Yeah, no, I mean, some some editors are doing that guarantee, but on their own. Uh, what you get on Reads is both the guarantee and the liberty to choose the right editor for for your and the variety of editors on marketplace. I think you know, with more experienced authors, they're not really worried about plagiarism or someone stealing their work, right? Because these are professional editors. Um, how do you deal with that with you know new authors? Or sometimes I've noticed in the screenwriting industry, it's very much you know sign this NDA, you know, and then maybe I'll show you my screenplay. That's happened sometimes on the market. We've seen uh, authors asking the editors to sign an NDA. Some will accept. To do that and we'll send the NDA some will just decline to offer a quote and move on to another project mm -hmm. um, so in that case the, the way it works on reads is you can ask five uh, specialists for a quote a maximum of five so we'll limit that so that it doesn't end up in like a huge bidding war between the, the professionals mm -hmm. but if uh, one or more of these specialists decline to offer a quote you can replace them by someone else on the marketplace so if you if you want them to sign an NDA and a lot of them decline, and a lot of them will, uh, you can replace them by others on the marketplace who hopefully won't decline to sign it. But usually I always say it's not a good idea because these people uh, have a reputation to keep and, and so they won't ever divulge information about a manuscript or do anything like that. Right, exactly. Um, so let's talk about just the subgenres of specialties. So how many editors probably are really good at contemporary romance or erotica or young adult romance? Um, so let me check right now on the marketplace. Um, so I'm going to select editorial assessment, mm -hmm. fiction, and romance. And we have 32 editors who do that. And if I filter further and check for people in the US, we have 30. Uh, right. So that's, we usually try to keep it around that for every genre um, so that you get a good list of people uh, and then you can kind of preview their profiles, check their portfolios, uh, but not a list that's too long that you can like drown in it uh, and not know who to select. So usually you'll get between 20, 30 people and it's quite easy to narrow it down to five because you look at their books in their portfolio and you see, ah, oh, this book's kind of similar to the one I'm working on right now, or this book I've read and I love it, I would love to work with that editor. So it's usually simple to, to select five. And as long as you're there in the marketplace, we also check you know, how many people specialize in romance for cover designs and for uh, marketing. Yeah, so cover design, we've got 17 designers right now who say they can do romance. Um, we haven't. We don't have a lot of them who've worked on um, on contemporary romance and erotica, but we're adding them as we speak. So our curation team is looking for for some, and we'll uh, add more over the next few days. So we'll we'll have more in that category. And in terms of um, publicity, so these are publicists. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got five. Um, who do romance, and most of them are in London, but we've got one uh, in the in the United States. So okay. pu publicity is a is a fairly new segment, and um, it's one that's a bit tricky because a lot of people will say they're good publicists, but they're good at selling themselves and not really good at selling books. So uh, the curation's a bit harder there. Okay. So, you know, let's, the cover design, I know we'll get into that later with Leslie, but, you know, for the publicist, uh, would you recommend that people use your publicist right now, or maybe just wait a little longer, especially, I think most of our audience is here in the U.S.? In general, I mean, uh, hiring a publicist, uh, you gotta, you gotta have a story mm -hmm. to sell them. I think in, in most fiction genres and in romance, it's, it's hard to have a, a story to sell to a publicist unless uh, it's a story about yourself as an author. 
so I've sold that many books or um, I've moved on from traditional publishing to self-publishing and still I'm still a success or the opposite direction. I started self-publishing and then got to deal with traditional publisher. Then you can sell stories like that. Uh, otherwise, what you can hire is a publish uh, is a publicist for to organize a blog tour. And so that's what most of our fiction publicists specialize in. Uh, and in that case, I mean, I'd recommend authors to kind of reach out to four or five romance blogs and try to be featured mm -hmm. on them, see what the impact of that is. And if it has a good impact on sales and you think, okay, being on these blogs and getting reviewed on these blogs or doing Q&A, Q&As uh, actually has an impact on my sales, then I'm going to hire a publicist who's going to organize a real blog tour campaign for me and, um, and get me on 20 blogs because that's going to positively impact my sales. And so what I spend on, um, on a publicist will have a positive ROI for me. So that's my advice to authors. Not hire publicists right away. Only, only if it's a strategy that makes okay. sense for you. So, you know, when we talk about scheduling out the cover design and the editing and possibly the publish publicity, how soon in advance should people do that? Should it be uh, two months out from when they need someone or there's so many people, it doesn't matter. I can just put my bid in the morning of and have someone by that evening. Um, no, no, you need to schedule a few months in advance, especially for, for editing. Uh, cover design, it depends. You're usually able to find someone on the marketplace who will be able to do the work uh, in the next few weeks. Um, it won't be maybe the person you really wanted to work with, but it will be someone good. For editing, it's good to reach out, usually, I say, when you finish your first draft. Mm -hmm. And then you work through your second, third draft. Uh, but in the meantime, you book an editor for when you're finished with that third draft. And so that should be one, one two months. And so that's time. developmental editing. So what about the line editing? When should yeah. that start being planned for? A month before to make sure you, you work with the person you want to. Um, we've had to uh, line it. So proofreading or copy editing, proofreading jobs being um, being booked one or two weeks before, uh, and it's also a quick job. So in three weeks, it was done. But I generally recommend to reach out a month in advance for uh, for proofreading and copy editing. Okay. And I guess if you're ready, we could switch over to the website and just walk people through once they get there, how do they um, how do they sign up for Readsy? Sure. And you know, just budget-wise too, if you can talk through what was you're going, like how much do they plan for for each book or novella? Because some of the novellas are only 20,000 words. so that might be a lower price point, but the cover is still going to cost you the same amount, and so will the publicity. True. Yeah, sure. We can switch to to the website. Or do you want me to talk about budget uh, sure. first? Sure, you could do that. Let's talk about that first. Um, so, all right. So the the cost for developmental editing I mentioned already for for eighty thousand words, around one thousand five hundred. Um, for short novella. An editorial assessment is going to cost maybe two, three hundred dollars, um, something like that. To open the editing around five hundred, six hundred. Um, I can. I don't know if I can show you the the cost, the average cost per word afterwards, but I'll have to do it through through an email, maybe okay. with a replay, because uh, I don't know all of these by heart, uh, but I know we can calculate them. Okay. So that that might Great. be easier. For cover design, the average on the marketplace is seven hundred dollars. Uh, we've got designers who will do a cover for three hundred, four hundred, and others who do covers for two thousand dollars. But that's usually in um, in genres like uh, like uh, fancy or sci-fi, where they where they do digital paintings and kind of create a whole universe on the cover, hand-drawn, illustrated. So um, that's obviously more expensive than using. Um, stock photos and um, and Photoshop. To and is that uh, a, a paper cover or is that an e-cover? Because they're different, right? They're different. So the depending on the designer, um, they might charge you a bit more for the for the physical mm -hmm. cover. It's usually maybe they're going to charge you a third of the price more. For the for the paperback cover because they have to design the spine and um, mm -hmm. and the back, some will do it for the same price. Uh, so it depends. Usually, it's not a huge difference. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> and um, so for publicity, I mean, we don't really have enough 
data to tell because the service uh, is mm -hmm. too young. But for a blog tour, uh, we've seen quotes range from maybe five hundred dollars to thousand five hundred. Okay. Thousand for a really good publicist with a lot of contact with bloggers. Oh, and I forgot to ask: Does uh, do you have copy editors who will write, you know, that blurb for you on the back um, of the book? So I know some of our editors have done that for authors, uh, and they include it in the quote. So if when you reach out to a copy editor, for example, and you ask them, you can ask them, can you also include in your quote um, the the writing of uh, of my copy of the blurb or of the product page on Amazon and most of them will accept to do that, um, but we don't have a specific category for that, so I can't really tell Got you the it. price. <laughs> All right. So if you guys want that, you should try to negotiate that into the edit. Exactly. Good. All right. Perfect. Do you want to? Um, I don't know if I can show the. Uh, sure, website. I can do a screen share. Got it. Um, It'll be one of those picture-in-picture -picture things. So. Yeah. Let's do this. Let me open up another browser. Oh, yeah, could you? Maybe I can try. I'll try to share the, the Ritzy marketplace. I don't know if it's going to work. Is it working? Maybe can you? Everyone mention in the comments if you can see the the screens. Yes, tiny but there. So you can see the reasy.com, but I think because there's three of us up there on the the sharing, it might be a little smaller. Yeah, that's true. Um, all right, I'll kind of run you through the marketplace in tiny. Uh, and then it's uh, it's I'll share with you a link where through which you can register to to get a discount on Reedsy. So the marketplace looks like this. Uh, you have filters here, so editing, design, publicity, marketing, and you've got filters down here um, by type of service. So the content editing, copy editing, editorial assessment. So usually when you do a search, uh, I suggest you use all these filters. So if you're looking for a content edit for a romance book and someone who knows you as English, you put all these filters in, and then you get 36 professionals, and you can go down the list. If you click just next to an editor's name, you'll see that there's a little preview that comes with the books that they've worked on, and also their, their work experience. So it's a, it's a simple way to kind of see if you want to see more or not, and if you want to see more, you click on their name, and you can see the profiles, what I mentioned before, with their work experience and all the books they worked on. So if you like that editor, you can just select her. Then you can select up to five, hit continue, and then we prompt you to fill in a brief about your book. And so that brief contains all the information the editor is then going to need uh, in order to offer a quote. Obviously, that brief is different if you request editing or if you are looking for design or publicity. Uh, but it contains um, some of the same questions, like title of the book, uh, the kind of services you're looking for, the timelines, and the short introduction about the book. And often, so for editing a sample so that they can see, their, see your writing and even perform a sample edit in the case of uh, copy editing or proofreading. Then you submit the brief, and we have a policy that they usually answer between uh, uh, within 48 hours. So within 48 hours, you at least have a message from them, and in three four days, you get uh, you get the quotes. Okay. So that's that's mainly it for the how the marketplace works. Perfect. And so it says my books request. That's kind of a dashboard for each person when they sign up with it for an account. Exactly. So on the My Books, you access the Ritzy Book Editor, which is something I haven't talked at all until, until now. But it's basically um, a writing and format tool which we released last month. And that looks a, a little bit like this. So you can see some are discriminated chapters or sections um, on the left. You've got the front matter, the back matter, and the body. You can move chapters around. Oh. 
Uh, and if I go through the first chapter, as you can see, the images are supported, so you can just drag and drop images within the within the Rootsybook editor. Mm -hmm. You can format your text. You can add new chapters, and so I'll I'll let you play around with it uh, for for those of you who want to write a book or who want to copy paste some some section of your book. But the idea is that when you're ready, you click on export here. And you get this nice export page where you can choose your styling, choose uh, if you want an EPUB and Mobi um, file or a PDF file. Mm -hmm. And then the trim size you want for the PDF. Mm -hmm. So at, at the moment, we only have one, but we're, at the, we're pushing out uh, three others uh, as, as I'm speaking. And then you can choose between two templates. Same here, we'll be, we'll be adding more. And then you click on export book, and it will come here and um, also within an email uh, for the PDF. So it's basically free formatting and conversion both to EPUB and to print ready PDFs um, for authors, for anyone who has a simple format. So no tables or graphs or things like that. Uh, so it's kind of um, it's kind of a game changer for, for independent authors. And obviously, we're improving on it constantly because we, we released it last month. But it's already uh, allowed a few hundred authors to kind of export a professionally looking book. That's amazing because people pay, I mean, not a few cents to get that done because uh, the whole conversion and formatting is it's just such a it's mess and it's very technical and it's kind of scary. Um, so that's great that you guys offer that for free, right? Yeah, I mean, we've had two developers work on this for, for six months. There's really strong technology behind this. Um, and as you mentioned, we, we kind of built it because um, last year we, we released a book as a, as a special side project. Mm -hmm. uh, and we saw the, the nightmare that it was to kind of prepare the PDF uh, in InDesign and, um, and even the EPUB with, uh, with the CSS. So we thought, let's build a tool that will Kind of automate this process at least for simple formats mm -hmm. and uh and that and let's make it free for authors because i mean the technology exists it's just a, a matter of building it so that's what we did great and this is really limited to text right like picture books and people with lots of graphics should probably do another service for right now right and do you guys make it more advanced yeah definitely uh so if you've got a, a more complex format uh, so children's picture books or graphic novels, or even nonfiction with lots of charts and numbers, then I recommend going to the marketplace to design mm -hmm. and select book, uh, book interior design, which is basically typesetting, book layout design. Mm -hmm. And then same here, filter by genre languages, and we'll have some really, really good typesetters uh, and book layout designers on Reedsy for any genre. Great. And do you think you guys will offer translation services? Because I know there's a big push for people to start selling in foreign markets. Um, yes, yeah, so that's kind of a secret, but uh, we're working. Thanks for <laughs> we're working on incorporating that <laughs> in the next next few weeks. I think next few months. It depends on how quickly those uh, translator profiles uh, roll in, and we can launch the the little service here. So you'll see translation here when it's live. And so for some people, just backing up to the my books, for some of us who have our books, say in Scrivener or maybe Microsoft Word or Google Docs, can they upload? Uh, from that format into here so that we can have it put into Mobi from your website? Uh, soon, yes. Um, we will have a word import. Mm -hmm. Right now, what we recommend people is to do a copy-paste chapter by chapter okay. because it works really well and it respects the formatting. And then there's literally no work uh, to do the conversion. So it still saves you time even if you copy-paste chapter by chapter. But as I said, in um, a month or two, we should have a word import. OK. And then how do the finances work? Do I pay everything up front, or do I pay it in tranches or payments? Uh, so this, you have to check directly with, uh, with the editor and the designer. So when you, when you receive the quote, the quote will have um, a little dashboard for payments where they explain how much they want up front uh, and uh, how much they want through installments and as well as the currency and things like that. So everything is included and is customized really by the by the professional. And obviously you can negotiate that. But we pay the user would pay through Readsy, right? Not directly to 
the editor or the cover designer. Yeah, the, you you pay through receipt, so you have all account settings here, payment where where you can add your your payment details, and we prompt you obviously to add your payment details before you you accept a collaboration with uh, with an editor or a designer. Okay, so people can pay with standard credit cards or PayPal or Google P Wallet or. Uh, it's all credit cards at the moment. All credit cards. Okay. Okay. Great. This is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so even if you're not ready, you could, I mean, everyone could just go on there now and start a profile and, you know, maybe play around with my books. That seems like a great tool. Um, and just get familiar with the marketplace and what's out there and how you're adding to people every day, right? To the, to the library. Yeah, yeah, we are. Uh, and we're promoting everyone who we add through our social networks, through, through our Twitter uh, uh, and Facebook. Uh, so you can follow us there and you'll see the new people who, who we add. And, and one thing, so I mentioned this little offer for, um, for you guys, mm -hmm. is if you sign up through readsy.com slash loves slash RWA, you'll see there's this uh, little special page that we've built where we mention a free uh, $30 of Ritzy credit. And so that's basically a discount on your first collaboration on Ritzy, whomever you choose to work with, uh, whether it's for editing, design, publicity, when you accept their collaboration, you'll automatically have $30 discounted off their, off their quotes. So that's our, our, our offer. And, it, and this works if you sign up on Ritzy before the end of April. So you can sign up before uh, before May 1st, and then send a request for quotes even next year and collaborate two years, two years after that, you'll still get the discount. What's important is the sign up. Awesome, thanks so much. That's a really, so you guys said this is really great. I, I hope everybody knows that. I really just wanted to share this and so did Ricardo. Uh, you know, the chapter is not getting any kickback for any services that you use. Um, you know, Ricardo is here free <laughs> uh, just because we wanted to share this great resource and make sure that everybody knew. So um, you shouldn't feel like, you know, anyone's monetarily gaining or trying to dupe you. Uh, we really just think this is amazing and that everyone should know about it and, and really take advantage of it. So um, so thank you very much for that offer. That's that's a big help, too. My pleasure. Um, so does anybody, and I'll open up questions uh, maybe at the end, because I do know that we, I don't want to run out of time, and a lot of you people, a lot of you turn in covers, and you want to hear from a professional cover designer, uh, and we have one on the call today, and so we can, we can go through that as well. Is there anything else, Ricardo, we should cover before we add in uh, Leslie? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, if you anyone has any questions, you can maybe shoot them afterwards. Uh, but I think I've uh, mentioned everything that crossed my mind. Okay, great. So Leslie, or uh, Leslie, okay. Leslie, I'm going to, I just sent you a share the stage. Um, so if you accept that, then you'll be on camera. Maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Let me try something oh, it again. Here it is. <laughs> Wait. There you are. Oh, Hi. There you go. <laughs> uh, so let's just start with you two. Let's talk about um, you and how you got into cover designs and you know what your sort of forte is uh, of cover di design services that you offer. So I started designing covers um, years and years ago. I worked at Penguin for about 15 years, started as an assistant, worked my way up through designer to an art director. And I worked with the Berkeley Publishing Group, which is an imprint that published everything from romance to mysteries to science fiction, fantasy, fiction, nonfiction. So I really worked in all genres throughout my cover design career. Great. And, you know, there's such a big emphasis now on covers, you know, where they'll say it's almost like uh, and I'm sure all of us have been there where sometimes you've been duped into buying a book that wasn't so great. But you're like, God, that was an amazing cover, right? <laughs> because the cover is so great. So covers are really they're saying it's really going to make or break, you know, your book sales. So, you know, when you think about cover designs, um, what are some trends that you're seeing right now in the romance industry that are doing well and some trends that are going out that aren't doing so well anymore? Well, I still see a lot of covers that show objects instead of people. You're still seeing some of that or textures. 
but you are seeing a lot of couples too, like especially with new adult romance, which is kind of a pretty new genre. You see a lot of you know young couples. Um, you're not seeing so much risque covers anymore, like with erotica and stuff. You're, those are the ones where you see mostly like objects or some sort of texture, or like a bed or something, but not like you know anything too like risky, whatever. So okay, <laughs> what about heads? Because I noticed some will just cut off the head right at the neck and some show the full face. So what's um, what's the trend or what do you think does well? I think the reason why a lot of times you cut off the head is because you don't want, you want the um, the reader to really be able to picture the character. So if you show the character's face, then you're, you may, may not be with how the reader imagines the character. Sometimes, mm -hmm. honestly, like maybe the shots didn't turn out well or maybe the publisher doesn't like the model, how the model looks or whatever. So we're like, oh, I don't like how he looks, cut off his head, cut him off, like, you know, at the chin or something. But I think it just really depends on the publisher and what, and maybe even the author and what they want. Some authors do want heads, some don't. So it just depends. And how do you feel about refreshing covers? You know, because sometimes the clothes or the jewelry gets outdated. Should people be trying to actively update their covers for their backlist? I think so, because things, looks do get dated. So if you have something from like the early 90s or the 80s, it might look dated now. So it would be helpful to refresh it and for a new audience. So, and there are times when, when something comes out, it had a certain look, you know, and that's a look that worked for that time. But then... And it might be like a kind of cover that it might be for a book that's in a genre that has be, got gained more popularity, but the cover look for that new for that genre now is different. So you might want your book that's older to kind of have the look of newer covers that fit that same genre. So people will who like that genre who will, or find that genre for the first time will see your cover and think, oh, this is like you know something I've already read. So we'll okay. attract them to it. And are you seeing, so there's a lot of online split testing, right? A-B testing for different website looks. Are you seeing a lot of authors doing split testing for covers, right? So a man on, you know, on Amazon and then a couple for the same book on Barnes and Noble where they're really trying to figure out what's going to sell better. I don't think that happens a lot just because I think it's just a lot of money to do two covers for a book because you're paying maybe two designers or maybe like two sets of art or whatever, two photographers. So that might be costly. I've, I mean, I've seen that with, um, it's occasionally that happens, but it doesn't really happen a lot. I think usually it's one cover for a book. I mean, sometimes you see it, but I don't think it's very common. Do you think that it, there's any advantage to doing so though? Um, it might be. I, I mean, I know that when I was working at Penguin, there was a cover, there was a book that went out that we did do two covers for. I didn't do it, but like Colleen did two covers for, and they want, and I think it was separate ISBNs because they wanted to see which one did better. I don't think the book actually ended up doing that great. So I don't know which one actually did better, but they did want to see. And it wasn't just like, they, I think both covers were showing up everywhere. It wasn't like a one for Amazon, one for Barnes and Nobles. It was, they were both everywhere. And it was just like, they just wanted to see like which one would work better. Okay. And, you know, when we talk about sometimes the quickest and easiest way is to um, obviously just stick up a cover with some text, right? But you, the next step is probably to buy pre-designed covers. How do you feel that those are doing in the marketplace? And sometimes you end up having the same cover as 30 other books in your same genre. Yeah, I don't know if it's a really great idea to buy a pre-designed cover. I just, because you, you will end up with, you know, the same cover on different books and so many books fit the same genre. So the likelihood that you see the same cover is pretty high. I mean, I see the same shots all the time on covers and that's just, you know, like shots from Shutterstock or Thinkstock. Like I'll see shots that I've seen when I'm looking for shots for a cover and I'll see them on a book and I'll see the same mm -hmm. shot on multiple books and even books that are like I saw one shot that was on a YA book and then another one was on like another women's fiction novel so mm -hmm. I think I don't know I think you want something a little bit more unique than a pre-designed cover so if you are someone maybe on somewhat of a limited budget but you want an original cover that's not going to show up 10 other places um what's the best method for picking some stock photos um hmm I don't know what the best method is. I mean, for the inexpensive stock photos, the odds are that there's, I mean, there's a likelihood that your photo that you pick might show up someplace else. And there's really nothing you can do to prevent that. The only way to prevent that is to get something that's rights managed, but that's going to be a lot of money. I have no, I, I don't know what, 
a rights managed place would charge for a self-publishing author. I mean, their, their pricing depends on the size of the publisher. And I have like licensed stuff for eBooks that is, you know, around maybe 300 to $500 for desk for eBooks. Cause like for a major trade book, and these are usually exclusive rights. It would maybe like $1,100 or something for one of the big, um, right um management's like Trevelyan or Archangel or even like Getty or something so they may have lower rates for self-publishing people because it's not as many copies being printed but mm -hmm. that, I'm not sure but it'd be something to look into okay um and Greg just popped up with a question please comment on this opinion the huge majority of romance covers are frankly interchangeable what do you think about a cover that is appropriate but is very different from everything else out there well, I think it's always a good idea to do something that's different than everything out there because it will attract readers and, you know, like if something's different, I think it will stand out. And as long as it's something that says romance, if you're trying to do a romance cover, you don't want to do something that reads, you know, that doesn't read romance. But if it reads romance, I think it's cool to do something different because any kind of trend that happens is always someone that does it first. I mean, there must have been someone who did that first object cover it might have been 50 shades of gray actually that started it with just having like a mask or a tie or whatever they, i think it was a tie on the first cover and after that you kept seeing all these covers with objects and without having couples so there's always somebody who starts that trend so if you want to be the one that starts to trend for you know a new romance look then and it's attractive people should pick it up Again, I'm, I'll bring up this other point. I think the split A-B testing might work here. Yeah. <laughs> <Right. Probably would. laughs> Something right. crazy, right? Um, and see how that goes. But also, you know, I think a lot of things that authors sometimes forget is they should go into it and come to you with some sort of branding, right? So you should always be using the same font for your name or the same size or the same placement. So all of your books kind of have the same look and feel, right? It depends. I mean, if it's a, if it's a books in a series, then definitely you need to have like a series look. But if it's different, if your books aren't aren't related to each other, it does not necessarily have to brand. I mean, I guess branding branding something like branding your name, I guess, is probably like the most sensible thing. I don't know if if your series if you are writing different books and not part of a series, then I don't think having the same title treatment or something would make it, would you know be important because you want to differentiate them. But if it is in the same series, then definitely. You should have like branding. And what's the biggest mistake you see authors making right now with covers in in working with cover designers as well? Um, sometimes authors, maybe they get stuck on an idea or they get really stuck in like little details with like everything, like, like the hair color has to be exactly, exactly the same or it's not right. The outfits a little bit wrong or like something like jewelry or something on a character like they get really like bogged down with little little details that in the end is not super important so and could drive a designer crazy trying to like match what they exactly what their vision is when it's not really anything anyone's going to notice or it's not going to really help you know or contribute to the overall look of the cover Okay. And so when people come to you for their cover design, is there usually a client intake form? Like what should they have ready to go before they even contact you to start working on a cover design? Well, they should have some, like maybe some general ideas of what they want, or if they have like covers that they like, that they kind of like maybe want their cover to look like, not to copy it, but just like ideas so that you know what their like visual, like what their aesthetic is. Definitely have a synopsis in the manuscript. If they don't have the manuscript fully, then even if it's not finished, like the manuscript that the designer could read a little bit out to get like a feel for it. Or synopsis. If there's some, if there is some detail that they really, really want to include, maybe some science fiction thing, and there's a certain type of sword, and they really want that sword to be as perfect as possible, then you should get the description of that. Like so, pertinent details like that. Mm -hmm. Um, authors big say designing covers for themselves letting <laughs> design it yeah yeah <laughs> anyone not having someone who like can play with Photoshop a little bit you know is not really <laughs> the best way to go <laughs> right yeah I think even I see uh, is it can for a pick monkey and the, there's an option to create your own ebook cover mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> Do it yourself world out there. <laughs> um, all right, so let's get to uh, everyone's favorite part. But right before we do that, let's just talk about money for budgeting and finances. You know, what should people budget for when they come to you or someone of comparable value or cover design? 
Um, definitely budget, you know, the design fee and in certain cases, cost of imagery. I know like, it depends on if they want to use something rights managed and it's probably something that they would have to, you, you know, take the, you know, um, absorb the cost of because rights managed photos can be really expensive and it will take a lot out of the design budget. For royalty free images, I would think that designers could sometimes cover that. Some designers don't, depends, because there's a lot of subscription services out there. And some designers subscribe to those, so it's not really a lot of extra money to add to um, use those kind of shots. I personally don't because most of my clients actually pay for the images, so I don't actually subscribe to any of those. So I kind of figure that in when I'm doing my working out my design fee. But if you want to use rights managed images, it's going to be more expensive, and it's probably something the designer definitely won't cover because usually their fee is just for the design; it's not for extras like imagery. Like for and how many iterations do you do for people? How many what? Iterations of the design, right? Like, oh, I, I want her to have a gold necklace instead of a pearl necklace or whatever it is. I usually do. Um, I haven't yet had to do like a ton of different um, um, revisions. Usually I do like a few comps to start. And then once they be nailed down one, I'll do like little revisions. But it's never, I, I can't think of like having to do too, too many. So... I guess if, I don't know, like maybe two or three or something, but I, I haven't run into a problem. Of, I haven't run into any problems of someone like asking me to do a million different changes to the point where it's like, I'm almost redoing the cover. And at that point, it, I'd have to get paid more because it's reached a point where it's almost re redesigning it. I haven't had that problem. So, okay. Yeah. All right. And can people come back to you? I don't even know. Let's say the backlist, say, uh, two or three years later and get a discount for the edit or just a whole cover design altogether? I haven't, I don't know. I, I think I, that would probably be up to the designer if they wanted to offer a discount for something like that. Cause I mean, if you're redesigning it, then you're redesigning it from scratch. So it's, you know, it's the same amount of work as if you were doing it the first time. So, so that would be up to the designer, whether they would want to offer a discount for something like that. And they should definitely negotiate with you up front if they want a print cover versus E cover versus both. Yeah, yeah definitely. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So I am going to bring up the covers. We had a lot of covers. We're going to go through these one by one. Um, and Leslie's going to give feedback for all of you. Um, so can you guys see the screen? Is it small again? Yeah. Let's try to make it bigger. All right. So now you can't see any of us, right? I think you can just see the covers. Um, and let's just go, I'm going to pop open the first one. Okay. So my first thought in seeing this is that it looks a little bit like nonfiction just because black and white imagery, it looks like maybe like a nonfiction, like a memoir or something or nonfiction. I don't know if it's, is a memoir or not, oh, if it is a memoir, I mean, it's a romance of, mm -hmm. In the 60s and 70s, but I don't, so I don't know if it's meant to be a memoir, but that's kind of my first reaction when I see this. Okay. Uh, so here's our next one. This one, I like, I really like the imagery on this one. It looks a lot, it looks like, you know, stuff that's in the marketplace that you know, would probably fit in well, it's, you know, it looks like other covers in this marketplace. I do think the type looks a little bit generic, just her font. Yeah, her font. Just, you know, it just looks like, I mean, it looks very similar to other things I've seen, but it just, I think it maybe just needs to be designed a little bit more, something a little more special needs to happen with it. It's just my opinion, but other, overall, it looks pretty good, I think. It's hard to see the, the series name at the, the yeah, bottom. Yeah, it is. The white, it's almost white on white. Right. Okay. Um, I think she has another cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same thing. I mean, it's, for some reason, the type looks a little bit better here. Mm -hmm. Even though it's maybe the same the color. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but. Maybe it's the colors that she's using. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it just pops. Mm -hmm. uh, and the imagery looks, I mean, the imagery looks nice for that mark. Again, the bottom mm -hmm. is hard to see a little bit. The Wellington book mm -hmm. is kind of hard to see. Okay, great. And she's on a third one. Mm hmm Again, the imagery looks good. This one's a little different looking though, right? It looks a little more um, high-def photo for some reason. 
It looks like, honestly, it looks, it looks a little bit like it hasn't been retouched as much as the other two. Mm -hmm. And again, the bottom, the, the series low, the series line is a little bit hard to see also. Got it. Okay. I like the imagery. I think the font, her name is kind of hard to read and it's kind of bright and jarring. I'm, I'm assuming it's probably strictly for ebook because these colors, I mean, it, it looks very, uh, it looks a little bit too bright. Okay, yeah. maybe the color combinations. Yeah, just don't. combinations. And I think her font, her, her name, the font on her name is a little bit hard. It's a little bit hard. I don't. It's a little bit hard to read. I think like, personally, I just have like a thing where I don't really love seeing like script fonts with names. I, I rather just, see, I, I don't mind it with titles, you know, like having, you know, like a sans serif there with that script up there is fine. But like then having this very, like three different fonts too. So there's a lot of fonts going on. That's not really necessary. Mm -hmm. And so just to, for everybody, um, that's here. The the script fonts are more the cursive fonts. The sans serif is more the plain, easy to read kind of font, like a typewriter. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, I like these a lot. These look like really professional. And like you know, it's, I just said I don't like scripty fonts on names, but I actually don't mind it on her name <laughs> or his name. Exactly. Could be guy from her. <laughs> It goes with her whole look and feel, right? The feather and yeah, I like how it, yeah, and, and you can read it, and, and it's you know it's a little bit harder to read on the left side, but not tremendously hard. And I guess she's, I mean, you know, she's publishing, printing it, so sitting on a table, this would really stand out. Okay. I mean, it definitely looks like a romantic suspense, which I'm, I'm assuming is romantic suspense or a thriller. So it kind of like meets, it kind of does a the job there. It does look a little, the font looks a little bit blocky, but I don't know. All right. Yeah. Do you have a go-to font for titles that you really like, or it just varies by cover? It varies by cover. I mean, I, I get into like, I get into habits of using the same fonts all over again, all over and over again. And then I have to stop myself and say, I can't use this font. I can't keep using this font. This is ridiculous. I keep every book's going to have the same font because I just like find some font that I really like and I start using it again and again. But it really varies, you know, per book. But I think every designer probably has their fonts that, they're, that are their favorites and that, you know, for certain things and that they go to. And just to stand this cover for one more second, so she has a quote in there from another author, but I've no, the the fonts all almost kind of look the same size, so they seem to be competing with each other. Yeah, um, right. Or I would definitely have the quote a lot smaller. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, it could be smaller and it doesn't have to be tiny, but it could be smaller and less chunkier than than the title than the author. Because you definitely, is there a rule I heard once that the title is the largest, then the author name, and then any quotes or USA Today bestselling or something like that? Um, there's not really any rule. I think that, um, like, if it's an author who's, like, well-known and established, like, say, Nora Roberts or somebody, then their name, or Sylvia Day or somebody, their name is going to be huge compared to the title because you're really selling that author. But if it's somebody who's a first time author, then the title is probably going to be a bigger deal because no one knows who you are yet. So the title is more important. And definitely the quotes should be, I mean, there's no really no hard and fast rule, but quotes are definitely smaller. Than, sometimes you see covers though for like more literary books where they may have like, you know, the title and the word a novel written in the same size font. So it just really depends on the market you're designing for. All right. Like here, I think the title could actually be bigger. Mm -hmm. It could even like start to go over like the figure a little bit, even like something like, cause I think some, sometimes people, you know, they stick, you know, titles and they stick type in those very neat spaces. And if you kind of have things going over the imagery a bit, sometimes it could work. Mm -hmm. So I think, I'll, we, oh, sorry. And would you leave the Outlander series at the top? Yeah, that, that's kind of hard to read. Okay. Maybe change the font color or the color or just move it to a new place. 
maybe moving to a new place. I think sometimes with these series titles too, that you can even incorporate them a little bit with the title, like have it with the title. It doesn't have to be like set apart like that, like kind of like design it so that it's kind of flowing with the title a little bit. So it's kind of a unit, especially if it's a series, it's a brand because it's going to be more than one. So set up a more of a brand look with the series title. I really like this a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that with, I mean, I, I artistically, I love that it's black and white. Mm -hmm. I just imagine, like, I just know that, like, when I've shown, personally, when I've shown covers that are black and white, sometimes people say they look nonfiction. I don't think this looks nonfiction. I think it kind of looks suspenseful, like a romantic suspense or something mysterious. I do think, though, that when you think about it sitting on a table with a lot of other covers, that you might want to have, like, a hint of color somewhere, like, even if it's just in the title or in, in the word midnight or something, just have a little bit of color, though I do like the artistic idea of just having it black and white. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, like we said, try something new, and it might start a new trend. <laughs> right. That's true. <laughs> Like here, this one is black and white, but it has the color and the type. So that will, it gives it more of like a, a fiction edge and it will definitely, that pink will definitely pop. Mm -hmm. That was pretty funny. We didn't even, it's like the book cover order read your mind. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. This one, I like the imagery a lot. I think the type just looks like it's just kind of, place there like it's not there wasn't really any kind of thought like design like thought going into it it was just kind of just like type there and i, I personally i don't i don't love having the, the author name and italics like that slanted type And this one, I'm not sure if it's intentional to have that, um, the orb, or whatever it is, that jewel, like it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of white going on around it. And I don't know if that's intentional or if that's, you know, a silhouetting job that wasn't as good as, as perfect as it could be. If it is intentional, then I think you have to go further with this so that you really, it really looks like, you know, some sort of like, you know, um, distressed element mm -hmm. otherwise if it's not intentional if that if it's just you know then it should be cleaned up and the font's kind of hard to read too right yeah the font's yeah the font's kind of hard to read and we just have two more this one's hard to read see i don't know why it was just it was a small yeah but um, but it, it's good to actually look at these covers really tiny because they are small, you know, on the, the online site. So that's a good uh, point. Yeah. So if you can kind of read it there, then it's good. <laughs> um, it's, I think this works. I mean, it's it's a good imagery and, it, you know, it looks it looks pretty professional. And the type that I mean, I can actually read it this small. I could read the title and the author. The, I, I don't know if the author is someone I, I haven't heard of her. I don't know if she's well known, but maybe this, this is a case where the title should be bigger and the author should be smaller because unless she is a brand. Right. That's a huge author. You can, now that it's a smaller thumbnail, you can see it's a huge author. Yeah. Maybe the sizes should be switched. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then someone turned in just a link to her website. Oh, that was the same one, Carly Carson. 